So thank you everyone to, uh, for coming to the session on, on blockchain. Maybe just first with a few quick introductions. So my name is Tal Morgenstern. I'm a principal uh, for Oliver Wyman in the Sydney office, mainly focusing on financial services. Uh, hi, my name is Loretta Joseph. I'm an advisor to the Sydney Stock Exchange. I'm a director at a uh, venture capital company called Black Citrus and I'm the uh, advisory chair of the Australian Digital Currency and Commerce Association. Hi there, um, my name's John Palou. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, a software, blockchain software development company called Athera. Uh, we've built um, a blockchain lending platform or for digitising lending assets and making, making the cash flows tradable uh, on, on exchange. Um, uh, we're, this 2017, we're going to deploy our first enterprise solution. So that's us. Thanks. My name is uh, Chamiak Mimana. I'm one of the directors of Consensus. So Consensus is based out of New York. Uh, we're one of the biggest blockchain companies. Uh, we have about 150 staff worldwide uh, working on application level uh, on the, uh, the Ethereum platform. Very good. Thank you very much. So let's start with a, a, an introductory discussion on the regulatory framework surrounding blockchain for financial services. So regarding the regulation of digital assets in financial services, which countries are leading the way and getting it right? And has Australia missed a golden opportunity to take the lead in this area? Well, I don't think we've actually missed the opportunity yet, but it's probably getting close. Um, the Bank of England, who are not really known for their exuberance around um, startup start technologies, have been on the forefront of regulation around blockchain. The Bank of Canada are uh, looking at implementing digital currencies. Um, I think in Australia we sit in a really interesting position because we're a mature market. We have one regulator that is very supportive of new technologies and we have a government that has an innovation agenda. So I think um, in, in leading the... the the responsible adoption of blockchain. I think we do have a, a large opportunity to do that in Australia. I just think we have to be a little more proactive about how we go forward in the next six months to a year. I agree. So what are the international standards in the construction and use of blockchain in financial services? I, mean, I, I think it's too early to come up with standards uh, and also standards and governance and uh, regulation at, at the expense of, of diminishing the innovation. Uh, we, uh, us for one, we're working with uh, ISO, we're working, talking to SWIFT, uh, et cetera, around what standards could come into play. Uh, but the most important, I'd say, is Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which will be announced uh, this evening uh, in New York. Uh, we should be focused quite heavily on standards within the Enterprise Ethereum version of it. Uh, and I think that should be a good, great building block to see what comes out of uh, standards at protocol level. Uh, especially from an uh, Ethereum perspective. I think it's probably also really important that the industry develops their own framework first before it goes to the regulatory uh, you know, lawmakers. Uh, I think that they're best placed to, to make those, uh, I suppose, framework decisions. Sure. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah, industry <laughs> has to lead a drive to government first. So let's drill into one specific issue re related to this. So the insistence of banks, financial services, uh, the financial services industry and regulators on private blockchain to protect client and transaction privacy, will that that's leave a open blockchain like Ethereum, for example? So I'll talk of a, a non-financial services example. Uh, you've probably heard, heard of PHP Built-in's project, which we built um, earlier this year. Uh, that's a great example of where they went down the path of private, um, but they've now built it to a, a very scalable project. Uh, and and it, this is in production, so if anyone's concerned about blockchain not being here, uh, PHP is actually have deployed a production grade blockchain. Uh, and that's now taken to the next level of, of public, uh, which would then enable uh, vendors, uh, any of their other suppliers that come into to party uh, with this. Uh, the same would apply in the financial services. Um, there are many banks that are coming together uh, one in particular that we're working with in Europe, uh, where we will be doing uh, a similar project as well. I mean, I'll, I'll just add there, I think um, where we sit as a technology of blockchain, we're probably sitting back where we were in 1992 with the internet. And had AOL not been, had stopped the internet, Netscape um, launching their first Netscape, we probably wouldn't be sitting here with the internet. So I think the, the um, public environment 
the network effect is, is very important and I think um, if we go down the road long term we need to look at public blockchains, not private. I think there's also another issue that the, you know, it comes down to the consumers and um, although private blockchain satisfies the needs of, you know, financial institutions, um, it doesn't necessarily uh, satisfy the needs of the consumer. Uh, the consumer is, uh, is, is more and more disenfranchised with the way that the big financial institutions operate. They see it as very um, opaque uh, and blockchain is a really good way of um, giving the transparency back to, uh, to the consumer. The challenge is how do you satisfy regulation and you know the need for privacy of uh, identity and those sorts of things with the the trust built, putting the trust back into the into the system. Um, I think that's really where a lot of the blockchain companies and a lot of the financial services people have really got to focus their efforts. And it's possible to do. I mean, you know, we're working on some things. I know you guys are working on some things as well um, to kind of make that happen. Great, thank you. So bank consortiums, are they needed and will they work for the consumer? Absolutely. I mean, inherently blockchain is a, is a network effect um, uh, platform. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Uh, but, but a consortium that actually is involved in uh, working on a use case or uh, industry-focused consortium. So um, there are a few that come to, to, come to play. Um, I'm working with a couple of organizations, a uh, credit union consortium. Uh, insurance, uh, you probably guys have heard of one that we're working with. Um, but I quite, I mean, I do encourage industries to come together, but then focus on a use case, uh, because now you have an end, end goal, uh, as opposed to just coming together for, the, for a marketing tick or whatnot. Uh, I go, keep going back to the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, so that, that will be announced today, uh, and that'll bring some of the top, you know, top Fortune 500 companies together. Uh, in, a, in a consortia uh, that will also not just work on specific projects, but also the, the standards that we often talk about as well. Tom? I was just going to say again with the, with the banks and the, the consortiums, I suppose you know, uh, I'm an advocate of, largely I'm an advocate of open blockchain. I think that that's really where the market is, is ultimately going to get to. Um, my concern is with the uh, bank consortiums is that uh, the, the technology choice or the platform choice that they use um, might not be uh, the widely chosen version that the consumer is going to use, which means that the banks, if they're building on you know, one of the Ethereum alternatives, for example, I'm a, an, an Ethereum advocate, um, they might find themselves building, building an island that nobody visits. And that's going to be very hard to scale and then they're going to jeopardise the network effect. And I think that the network effect is the, the real benefit of blockchain. And some of it is not, blo not blockchain as well. Yeah. Of course, some of it's not blockchain. Yeah, some, some people don't need a, da a public database, so yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Um, it, so let's go a little bit more technical here. Cross-chain transactions, their possibility and effectiveness. Can you comment on that? So it is, it is here. I mean, it, we, we have deployed cross-chain. Um, uh, we have our own BTC relay, which is a blockchain to, uh, sorry, Bitcoin to Ethereum uh, cross relay. Uh, that's built by a chap called Joseph, Joseph Chow. If you guys are interested in reading up on some of this stuff, you could uh, read up BTC relay. Uh, Gavin Wood, who maintains one of the Ethereum uh, platforms, he uh, runs a project called Polkadot, uh, which is also an interoperable system that they've developed. Cosmos is another great example. So there are lots of efforts that come into play to work on actual blockchain. Uh, pro projects to interoperate within the, the private consortia, the private blockchain, as well as the public. Um, so yes, absolutely. There's, there's quite a few in play right now. That's great. So validity of data being hashed and submitted to the blockchain, what happens when operators get it wrong? Uh, I'll jump in here. Um, my greatest concern is uh, with blockchain um, is that uh, garbage in, garbage out. And if you don't have the ability to verify and qualify the data going in and, and being locked to the blockchain, um, you, you're setting yourself up for um, a present potential disaster. Um, and I think that more work needs to be done um, in, the, in that space. In addition to identity, identity is really incredibly uh, important. But um, once the data is on the blockchain, you, you can't change it, right? So you, you can amend it, of course, you can you know, update, but um, you know, it could, lie dormant in there uh, for a long time before it causes a problem. I mean, again, it's, it's things that we're working on um, as part of our enterprise 
um, deployments. Um, you know, we think it's a it's a it's a pretty important part. Um, so, but I think everybody else in the space really needs to be looking at it as well. And again, that's a network effect thing. So, it takes the big institutions that are creating the data um, to be able to you know verify or have a mechanism for verifying its validity. So since you mentioned that, so claim immutability of the blockchain, open versus private, markets are starting to question whether there is a reality, and if not, can the blockchain be trusted as a source of truth? Well, again, it comes back down to the, the, the trust of financial institutions. Um, you know, some people trust them, some people don't. But if, you, if they're running private blockchain, there's, there's a definite ability to, to change the path of, um, of truth. If they don't like it, they can reverse the transactions because there's no outside um, check system, right? They're in control of their own decisions. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's a certainly a downside to private blockchain. Um, it's certainly not the, uh, the end of the question. Like, I think that there are things that you can do to, to, uh, to lock down private blockchain so that um, it builds the trust back into it. And I think that, again, a lot of the developers really need to be looking at those sort of solutions. So if I may add, uh, I think it's quite a few people have often asked us this question, you know, the DAO was attacked and then you, you've hard forked it and you, you, you've changed a path of the blockchain. The, the DAO attack was not an attack on the, the protocol, it was an attack mm -hmm. at the application level. Uh, so, and the hard fork was an actual consensus community coming together, consensus, not us, the company, the consensus, the model of, of uh, public ex execution coming together. Uh, to go down that path. So I think that, that is a great example of the, the community coming together uh, to making sure this happened. Probably another of the questions that you, you, you get asked um, often is on the scalability, right? So in, in, in around the performance issues, is around the blockchain and so on. So scalability, transactional throughput, and transac transaction latency um, with open blockchain, what are the answers to these challenges? So I can address it from an Ethereum perspective, uh, all, all of that, all of the above. So we, we address it using three, uh, three parts, three, three pillars, if I could call it. Uh, one's proof of stake, uh, one's sharding, uh, and the other one's state channels. So proof of work is what, you've, what the current state of the blockchain right now, or Bitcoin as, as you like as well, where the, the miner would get paid uh, based on the, the, the proof, the proving of, of the fact. Uh, Proof of stake is, a, is basically a new version that we're working on which requires much less computational power. Uh, sharding is basically splitting the network uh, so that we have parallel computing, uh, which would also enable uh, computing and verification to happen a lot faster. Uh, state channels. So state channels is basically, how do I best describe it? Um, you're working on, on the intranet, you do your verifications, your transactions, and at the end of the day, you you know, if there's any reversals, er any er errors that need to be reversed, and then you, you put it on the blockchain. So there's three methods that, that this is being addressed. So, you know, a typical blockchain takes 10 minutes. Uh, Ethereum is 14 seconds, and you know, we're, we're working on a project that could potentially bring it down to four seconds. Uh, but this will not be an issue. I mean, come the end of 2017, we'll, we'll start seeing a lot more of these in, in, in effect as well. Thank you. Another tough question. So, um, on a secu blockchain security, what is the biggest risk to users and financial institutions right now and in the future? Please, please be honest here. I, it's funny, I actually did a project for Mark, one of Mark Carney's initiatives in Canada on the risk of not uh, uh, adopting with blockchain. Uh, the first risk is not adopting to blockchain. The second, uh, <laughs> uh, I think the most important thing, block, blockchain, and, I mean, the system has been around for a, for a little while. Uh, we haven't had any uh, breaches of, of privacy or security, uh, DAO aside. Uh, the main thing that I would see is your private key management. Um, this is the most important thing um, from anything from storing your own, your digital cash, right up to you know, uh, enterprise grade projects. Your private key management is the most important thing that um, everyone needs to really get their head around. Because once you've lost it, then you've, it's gone. <laughs> Thank you. Looking a little bit on the future, so crypto AUD, is it inevitable? And if so, how far away? Is there a place for the big banks' self-issued um, self coins? Uh, 
Do I think there's going to be a, a cryptocurrency in AED? Definitely. We call it the DAD, uh, the Digital Australian Dollar. We need one because if you, if you look at the, the blockchain ecosystem, um, on the blockchain you'll have the digital ID, then you'll have the automation of the processes and procedures. And to, to, fill that in, to fill the gap of the ecosystem, you will, you will need an Australian um, digital currency. Uh, the Bank of Canada are walk, working towards at the moment, the Bank of England. I think um, the Singapore Monetary Authority are about to announce a digital currency. Um, I think there will be a place for the banks to issue coins on, 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 the, on the trading side of the blockchain, but I think um, eventually we'll move to an, a, an Australian digital currency. How long that's going to be, I can't say because regulations move relatively slowly, but I think um, Everything's pointing in the right direction. The regulators are working really closely with the, you know, the RBA, and I, I think we'll get movement. How do we call it? Oh, sorry, just just joke. Um, so, as a wrap wrap up question before going to any questions from the audience, is there really a place for blockchain in financial services? And if so, what are the first real world blockchain based product services we are likely to see, and how soon? Uh, if not already there. Sorry. If not already there. Yeah. Um, look, I think 2017 is going to be a pretty, uh, pretty much a watershed year for, for blockchain. I think there's a lot of stuff that's been in proof of concept in the last couple of years. Um, you know, our own company, we've already got agreement from a couple of clients to deploy enterprise solutions this year. Um, so you know, it is moving, and it's moving really, really quickly. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a massive rush. I think that's it. So very, very soon. And Santander have actually, uh, so they've done their intrabank transfer. Uh, you could, I think there's a demo available as well online. Um, and then now they're working on the interbank transfer. So uh, that's a fairly decent uh, application that you've, and a production grade application that you should research on. Um. I think there's also, uh, the other thing that we've got to realize is that, um, that blockchain itself is, uh, is, is really around providing transparency and trust back into a system, uh, which has been challenged over a number of years. And uh, it's one of those things that um, will definitely drive change, will definitely drive, drive accountability. Um, and I think that the financial uh, services industry would be in a better place if they chose to go down that road before the regulators forced them to, because they will be in more control of how they deploy it and under what sort of frameworks. Uh, it's just a matter of when. That's, um, that's the thing. I mean, I think when you automate processes, that's what we're talking about in the blockchain, um, when you disrupt people's role, relevance and revenue, there is pain and, and change is pain. But I think um, yeah, the, the first stage of the blockchain is really bringing automation into that, that um, financial transaction process. Um, so you know, dealing between A and B without the intermediaries. So when you, when you take out intermediaries, you do upset industries. It's what we're seeing at the moment in the financial um, services. But I, but I think over time, you know, people, banks will work out there's other ways to make money. So if I may, add yeah. a couple of things. I mean, you, 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 sh you should try and download a, a, a Bitcoin or a blockchain a, a wallet and play around with it. You know, you could pay, pay, pay each other a dollar at a time and, and see how the money moves, see how all of this works. It, it's fairly easy applications to use. JAX is a great wallet, so J A double X. Uh, that's one I use when I demo people how I pay money. Um, you know, we've done examples where we've transferred X amount of money through seven people, uh, and within, you know, you, you know, over a period of, of an hour, and you you could fairly, uh, you know, conveniently make lots of transfers and pay a tiny fee in mining. Uh, you should you should do that. You should play around with it. Uh, if you haven't seen an actual blockchain transfer, um, one of my colleagues, Henry, is here from Canada. Uh, he'll show uh, some of the swaps. He'll show, uh, show a swap application, uh, a proxy voting application. Uh, you should get your, you know, roll up your sleeves and, and really get into this stuff because it, it is here. Uh, playing around with Bitcoin is, is I mean, it's, apart from doubling since November, uh, <laughs> it's a great application. Uh, the wallets are great applications for you to play around with. There's actually a great PDF. If you just go, and because you've got the internet, if you download... Um, Bitcoin PDF is about an eight-page document. Um, a lot of it's quite technical, mathematical, but there's about one page in there that describes the book, the technology behind Bitcoin, which is what the blockchain is. So I, I think that's a really good document for everyone who wants to learn a bit more about it to go and read. 
Thank you. Just one one last question. So one of my clients is is actually thinking in writing a proof of concept for for commodities trading, right? And um, I, I probably see myself like blockchain more suitable initially for financial trading rather than consumer and retail. Do you see the blockchain is tending quicker at least or sooner to the wholesale industry rather than retail because of you know all the potential issues with consumers? Um, look, I think the, the wholesale market is probably going to happen first. Um, I think that there's there's more money to be spent developing the technology and there's more, more to be gained and more to be lost if they don't. Um, um, so, yeah, I think the answer is, yeah, wholesale is definitely going to come first. Um, retail, it takes big participants, you know, like the big banks with the big customer bases to engage their customer um, base and, and promote it and, and um, you know, sell the benefits before that sort of consumer um, uptake happens. Um, I don't think that the speed of blockchain, um, I know that it, it's, it's improving in speed all the time, but I don't think that that's really the barrier to um, the trading elements, because I think the trading engines, uh, like in a, in a stock exchange or, a, um, or, or an FX exchange, are completely separate from the settlement of the ownership of the asset itself. And so those sort of clearing functions, they don't need to be real time. So it's not really a barrier. I think a lot of the existing technology can connect into the blockchain piece and still work. And I think the beauty of the blockchain is if you look at anything, it's got a registry function. So any, you can put, whether it be a land title, um, a currency, a, a voting right, anything that can go on as a registry function, the blockchain will really significantly diminish the process and procedures and the automation of that. So that's where the big value is, um, the, the money saving and the efficiency in, in that function. And uh, we certainly see a lot of work happening with, with government. Um, I spent some time in Estonia looking at their it's not a blockchain, but it is a distributed database system, and I've seen how they've evolved. Uh, but certainly from, from an organizational perspective, we have a, a lot of demand from governments around the world, and you've seen what we're doing in Dubai on their 2020 project. So there's a lot more government that comes into play. Canada is a great example. Um, Singapore, we're going to be there next week, uh, talking about a lot of their initiatives as well. So yeah, government will surprise us. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Um, a Thank, thanks so much for that. I, I don't know if you have any more questions for uh, from the audience. Okay, so I, I think I need to wrap up. Thanks so much, <laughs> and hopefully that was very interesting. At least it was for me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.